Kepliger. I'm the executive director of the Benedict 16th Institute for Sacred Music and Divine Worship. Sacred Music and Divine Worship. Okay, I'm now going to have to mute you all because I can see it's a problem. So let me mute all speakers. You may have to unmute yourself. Um, just remember that. Um, so, and I know we invited people from uh, both of our lists, uh, as well as direct marketing. So, and also from various ways. And I know some friends of the painters may have been invited personally. And so I, uh, and also people from the Children of the Immaculate Hearts uh, newsletter may be joining us. So I just wanted to say that uh, freethemass.com is a project of the Benedict 16th Institute. This is, and, and we were both were founded by Archbishop Cordelioni, whom we're so pleased to have with us uh, tonight. This is the kickoff of our year for the homeless. I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, uh, and I just like to review now kind of the, what we're gonna do here tonight. And it's gonna be very jam packed um, hour and a half. Uh, after the Archbishop welcomes us with prayer, I'm gonna say a few words about St. Josephine Bakita the patron saint of those who've been trafficked. And I know that Grace Williams, the founder of the Children of the Immaculate Heart has a real heart for this saint. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also widen the discussion to learn more about the important work that Children of the Immaculate Heart is doing. And a little bit with Marianne Carr Wilson, who we're so pleased to have with us. Back when Marianne uh, was affiliated with the B16 Institute, we, you know, I first learned of Children of the Immaculate Heart when Marianne said she asked if we could go and uh, as a service do a Gregorian chant workshop with the women there. And that was an amazing experience that I'm hopeful Marianne will share with us tonight as well as some of the other work that she's doing. We have a... Um, we will briefly introduce Bernadette Karstensen, whose name, whose married name is Cody. So you're gonna see her as Bernadette Cody. And she is our, the painter of a new painting that we've commissioned for this year. So we'll talk to her and she'll show us, or I will show the, or possibly her husband who I think is here will show, one of us will show the, um, a sketch of St. Josephine Bakita and we'll like to auction that off if we can to raise money for Children of the Immaculate Heart. And then we'll have a little Q&A and comments, questions, maybe a little applause for the Archbishop after the momentous uh, injunctive relief decision from the Supreme Court. And we'll close it out with, <laughs> you got some applause from the uh, Marianne Carr Wilson corner over there. Um, and we'll close it out with uh, the Marianne and her choir, who uh, will do a litany to Mary that we can join in at home. Zoom, as you know, doesn't really allow people to sing together. That's why Marianne has all uh, a section of her fabulous San Diego choir, children's choir together so that we can hear some beautiful music, which will be a real treat. Afterwards, uh, I stay for a social half an hour. Uh, you all are invited. Uh, the Archbishop sometimes does if his schedule permits and the panelists may or may not be able to stay, but that's just a chance for us to chat and get to know, say hi to old friends and get to know some new people. And it's usually my favorite part of what are almost always really wonderful evenings. So thanks for being there. A long introduction, um, Archbishop, will you lead us in prayer? Okay, thank you, Maggie. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm very appreciative of our, our masters and geniuses with us tonight, um, Mary Ann and your wonderful choir of such beautiful work you're doing. And uh, Bernadette um, with another end of art, um, art properly speaking. And uh, Grace, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the founding and development uh, of this effort. So. Uh, I, th I thought we'd just begin with a simple brief prayer, the, uh, since this is the feast day of St. Josephine Paquita, that we begin with the uh, 
collect for her feast day today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who led St. Josephine Bakita from abject slavery to the dignity of being your daughter and a bride of Christ, grant, we pray, that by her example, we may show constant love for the Lord Jesus crucified, remaining steadfast in charity and prompt to show compassion. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Um, I see that uh, Grace just rejoined us. She must have gotten kicked off. So I'm going to, pardon me a minute. I'm going to find her. And, I'm here. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay. So long as you're there, because uh, we're going to be chatting in a bit. Um, I, uh, uh, I think St. Josephine Baquita is just one of those amazing stories that most of us didn't know until we needed her story because we became aware that slavery is, is not something that's gone and passed and forms of slavery exist even in developed countries in America, in all of our towns and cities. Um, St. Josephine, uh, that's not the name her parents gave her. She, she did not know the name her parents gave her uh, or at least it's not recorded. She was kidnapped as a child by Arab slave traders, traders at the age of seven or eight, uh, two years after her elder sister was similarly uh, trafficked. Uh, she was um, sold, exchanged hands many times. Um, some of the owners were less cruel. Many of them were quite cruel. Uh, in one of the homes, she describes that uh, there was a new wound every day, every day a different wound. Her flesh was scarred, which was um, some kind of uh, traditional local custom adapted to torture slaves. So the, 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 the you know, with a razor, uh, with salt, to make sure that the wound was both very painful and resulted in a, in a very visible scar. Um, she was eventually sold to the vice consul of Italy. Uh, she's from originally from the Sudan, but uh, she had traveled far from, from there, I think, I believe to Morocco, who uh, brought her eventually to Italy and gave her to his wife. And if I have the story exactly straight, um, sorry, I'm admitting latecomers. Uh, after three years in Italy, he decided he, he, his wife wanted to take, go back to Morocco with her husband. And um, so she had left uh, St. Josephine with the Kenosian sisters while she traveled to visit her husband's. And then she came back to claim her. Uh, and this was where St. Josephine um, learned about Christianity. Anyway, this was now uh, in the late, late 19th century. So not that long ago, uh, an Italian believed that they had the right to transport a slave to Italy and then take them back as property. Um, she refused and fled to the Kenosian sisters and fought in the Italian courts who said, um, thankfully and rightfully, that Italy does not recognize slavery. She had never been to property and uh, she was given the choice and she became a Kenosian sister. Um, quite remarkably, she was once asked what would she do if she met those who captured and tortured her? And she said, I would kiss their hands because if that had not happened to me, I would not be a Christian. So when I hear stories like this, it's very inspiring, but I also have to say it reminds me that I'm not a saint. Um, well, keep trying. Uh, I know that Grace, who has founded Children of the Immaculate Heart, which is just an extraordinary refuge in San Diego, for uh, primarily women, but they're now expanding with a new home for minors. 
And uh, I don't know all of the programming she does, but with a real heart for creating a place of healing for some of the women who've experienced the most horrendous abuse uh, possible. And um, with, uh, so I thought, uh, Grace, I wanna hear more about Children of the Immaculate Heart, but maybe you could start by telling me um, your relationship with Sister Josephine Bakita. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, the first time that I heard about St. Bakita was when Pope Benedict um, is issued uh, Space Salvi Saved in Hope, which was, I don't know, <laughs> 10 years ago or more. <laughs> I can't remember. But um, I, I think it was the first time a lot of us heard of her. He writes about her on, I think, the second or third page of the encyclical and uses her as an image of hope. Um, and so, although, of course, she is the church's patroness of traffic persons, I think um, she has something to teach all of us about the theological virtue of hope. I mean, it's something God infuses, but that she um, she just lived to the you know to a, a saintly degree, obviously. Um, you know, and you mentioned um, you know that she didn't know her childhood name. She actually forgot her own name. The experience of being kidnapped, removed, and tortured was so traumatic for her. And so she really has a lot to offer um, to those that we serve who have experienced really severe trauma. And it just, I mean, St. Begita is such a human saint. Like she really suffered. Um, and she also really had a lot of joy. Um, and so that's one of the things I really love about her. There is a good movie um, for all of you out there that is Ignatius Press has it, but it's a, an Italian saint movie, English subtitles, but it's just called Begita. Um, subtitle is From Slave to Saint. But, you know, there's a little Hollywood uh, in there, but the general gist of the story and her spirit, they captured extremely well. Um, I had the privilege of going um, to visit her tomb a couple of years back. You had an appointment, didn't you? Oh, now, can we all mute? It? Somebody is not muted. Let me try muting all again. Grace, you may have to unmute yourself. That's okay. Okay, there you go. Sorry, some latecomers not muted. <laughs> Yeah, so the convent that she's in is in a little town, um, Schio, in just north of Bologna uh, in Italy. So I got to go visit the Kenosian sisters there and visit her tomb. And you can go in her cell. Um, you can see all of her her, her meager earthly belongings. But um, yeah, she just, um, she's a, really a perfect picture of redemption to me. I mean, Christ wants to live his life in all of us again, over and over, right? That's the goal of the Christian life, like that we might become another kind of incarnation of the word. And, and she lived that, she lived that in forgiving those who tortured her, like the, you know, the quote that you said, actually, that, that full quote is like, if I were to meet the slave traders and those who, who tortured me today, I would kneel and kiss their hands because if it were not for them, I would not be a Christian or a religious today, right? And just that recognition that we all have to go through. <laughs> we resist it, <laughs> but everyone suffers, right? We all suffer and um, in different ways. But the, that interior path of accepting that suffering in union with the suffering Christ and like the transformation that Christ makes of our lives, um, that's what it's all about. And that's what makes people um, <laughs> in the end is, is accepting that and not like St. Paul, like kicking against the goats, right? Um, so that's, I think the thing that Bikita offers the most is that, that hope in the face of suffering. And actually in that same encyclical, Pope Benedict talked about how a society is only um, a truly human society when the members of that society accept the members who are suffering. And we can only accept the suffering members of our society when we accept suffering in our own life. And I think that's really key to our work with the trafficking survivors is we can only help them if we've accepted our own suffering. You can't give what you don't have. So you can't look at someone who's been through hell on earth and help them if you're not willing to accept your own cross. Um, and so that's what Bikita has, has really taught me to, to embrace the cross and to let it bear the tree, of, I mean, become the tree of life for us to bear Christ in our lives. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you became, got into this uh, apostolate, this ministry with Children yeah. of the Immaculate Heart? 
Of course. Um, I was on a pilgrimage in 2012 through the missions, um, biking through the missions of Southern California. And the priest who was leading that pilgrimage was reading a book on trafficking. And I had done volunteer work in college, but I was on the religious life path going a different way. Um, and he and a few others of the group really felt this call to do something for survivors of trafficking. Um, and uh, really kind of felt that you know, there's a lot of, there's, in the United States, there are a decent number of, like, ministries to this population, but not very many Catholic ones, and so we're like, why isn't the church responding to this? Like, we should do this, and I, I thought that was great for them, you know, walked away from the conversation, but little by little, our Lord started to show me that this is what he wanted me to do as well, um, and I'm actually a convert, and one of the, um, I would say the biggest thing that first made me realize that the church is the church <laughs> was all of the church's teaching on the dignity of the human person, on women, on human sexuality. Like that was all like clear and no one else, no other church teaches all of these same things. Um, so this ministry kind of embodies what the church gave me as a woman and gave me as just a human person um, of understanding like what our dignity is what the incarnation actually means for our humanity. Um, it was a way to like live that out for some of the most suffering members of our society. So you, what was the first thing you did? Like, how do you go from having that sense that you're led to do help? Like, yeah. I mean, a lot of people would just say, okay, I'm, I'm, well, a lot of people ignore that impulse and yeah. something else, or they pray <laughs> about it, or they, give money. And by the way, thanks for everyone who's on this. Uh, many, many of you, I think we had over 50 uh, donors. Um, so we, I, I shouldn't say this because I really appreciate you and she needs, the, the women there need the money. So, but you know, it, 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 you've taken on this mission in, in a really extraordinary way. So how did you get to where you are now from that first impulse? Um, so I moved to San Diego at that time and um, just started meeting with a new priest for spiritual direction, Father Gismondi, for those who know him. You know, we would always joke about it because I, I, for months, I would just come back and talk to him about this work. And he's like, what do you need? A house? Just do it. Just do it. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> so I, he kind of just kicked me in the pants. Um, so I started volunteering that year at another program um, here locally just to get a little bit of in a residential setting doing this um and I mean my dad's an attorney who does nonprofit formation so he kind of helped me do that and the need is so big that I mean we had a woman with four kids come to us like really quickly and that was just the beginning of so what did you do for her you had this woman who's suffering what 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 how did you respond what did you do we got her an apartment. Can't do anything if we don't have a place to live. <laughs> um, got her into therapy, got a case manager. Um, and, you know, actually she ended up referring one of her best friends out who had recruited her into the life. It was a very beautiful story. Um, and the rest is history. I mean, that was in 2014. So that program, you know, we've built over the years and are still, you know, always growing. Um, but we so have tell us. Go ahead. No, you're good. So tell us about um, tell us about where you are now. Tell us about yeah. So that that program is now called Saint Bakita's program, actually. And there's about eight women and I think 18 kids or so in that program. Um, so they have like housing. So they each have their own apartment so they can live as a family because these women have not had the chance to like really provide a life for their kids and build their lives together. And eight moms and 20 kids in a house with complex trauma is not a good idea <laughs> so they have their own space um and we help them find work um we have a couple who actually work for us um maybe get their education if that's something that they need or want to pursue um we have a few different therapists that we work with for individual therapy we have a case manager um, who does quite a lot for them there's our program manager as well some of that is just like supporting them. The thing is they don't have a support structure a lot of times. Their support structure was people in gangs, which is not helpful. So we try to just provide them with a place to belong. They can stop in for office and do whenever they want. <laughs> um, and, and that's basically like help with groceries, transportation, just basic 
basic stuff, um, just try to get them back on their feet. In a second, I'm gonna bring in Marianne. So Marianne, be ready. But um, can you give us like, think about one example of uh, a woman's story that you can tell without her name and how children of the Immaculate Heart have made a difference in, in her life? Um, I mean, there's one woman that comes to mind um, who's just very dear to me and actually to Marianne as well uh, she, from working with our clients. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't say too much detail, but I mean, <laughs> it's hard because sometimes a, a kid was maybe uh, trafficked for a short amount of time, but sometimes it happens that like this one woman was you know, sexually abused in her own home from five to 15. And before that, her mom was in the life and lost her because she was in the life. And then her mom died because it's a dangerous life. So she has like 15 years already of like severe suffering and trauma and sexual trauma. And then at 15 runs away and met us like 20 years later. So you're looking at just like 35 years of like pretty severe, um, just really severe like trauma, torture, like near death experiences. Like, and she's actually like a really lovely and pleasant person to be around. <laughs> um, she's just a really dear soul with like, um, she's just so real about life. And, um, and, and the thing that I love about our clients is, um, you know, Edith Stein has this, or you know, stole this expression from John the Cross, really, but that like only what is empty can be filled. Um, this whole idea of like, we have to be empty so God can fill us up. Our clients come so empty that they're so ready for God to fill them up. And often we're the conduits of his love, right? Um, so just like, she's just someone who is so eager to mm -hmm. soak up the love that we have to give her. Um, and it's just, it's so refreshing because most of us have so many walls and boundaries and we don't let people close to us. And they're just like there, which I think in the gospel is why our Lord was always close to like sinners and prostitutes because they were just ready to receive his love. They don't have any reason to keep him out. Um, so anyway, she to me is like a perfect example of that. Just someone who's like, so whose heart is so, so open and who's so loving, even though she's been through like so much. So how many people are you giving refuge to now? Yeah, so our, our other program is for teenagers. Um, Wait a minute, uh, you haven't, so the teenagers and the women, let's start with the, the women. With how many the women, women are you helping now? Uh, there's like eight of them right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're starting a new home for teenagers? Tell yeah, me so we, yeah, we opened in September. Um, it's a um, state licensed group home or residential treatment facility for 12 to 17 year old girls. So the kids are all from foster care or uh, on probation. So all kids who are in the system who were also trafficked. So again, you have a situation of like traumas of being in the system and then being recruited and trafficked. Um, so um, at this today, we have actually just three kids in the house. We have a capacity of six and we need to hire a couple more staff. So anyone's looking for a job, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> we go out to six kids. Um, but yeah, we have an in-house school. We have this. Well, you're fading out. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Just, My laptop yeah. is weird. You have to be like at a particular angle. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's better. Thanks for okay, coming here. What you have oh, to yeah. say. Of course. Um, so, Marianne, are you are you around? Can you pop up and say hi? Whoops. You need to unmute yourself, Marianne. Gotcha. Here I there am. you go. Well, now I see you. Um, so, Marianne, first, so it isn't distracting. Why don't you introduce that that choir of young people, that choir of angels behind you? Okay, so there are some really fantastic people here behind me. They're part of the Jubilate Deo Choir, which has 60, six zero members. And we have about, how many do we have? We have 11 here. So if you want to just just say hello, do you want first names? I can do that. Or did you want sure, to see? whatever them? you'd like to introduce your people. Your, your we're so happy that they're, you, you, you're all with us. So Sounds great. And I just want you to know, I, I think Grace knows this because I tell her a lot, but these people behind me pray for every week we have a class and they pray. Somebody remembers to pray for children of the Immaculate Heart 
every week, as well as Archbishop Cordelioni. Okay, so we pray for our benefactors as well. So we have Adriana with us today. And then behind her, we've got Paige. Am I in your light? Yep. Then Aubrey. Okay, so find yourself in the camera and then wave. So Sophia, Mary Therese, Rita. And in the back row, we've got Isaac. Hey, Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> There, he's, he's a Mrs. Gallagher fan for sure. So we've got uh, Will, Tad Wilson, another- Oh, there's uh, Tad. There's Tad. Sorry, I don't know all of you as well as I know Isaac and Tad, but I'm so glad there for you. There you go. Good guys. And then we have Isaiah Franklin, always looking pro in his bow tie. Whoops. For, I said first names. Franklins are very involved with uh, children in Mackhill Heart, so this is good. And then we have Ben back there, final base Ben. So yeah, that, that's what That's we have. wonderful. And uh, Marianne has launched, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, I guess we'll talk about it now. You have uh, uh, launched a new, newish venture. You're a long time, I mean, she, Marianne is one of, if not the most superb teachers of Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. She has been an opera singer, as well as a music director in a Latin mass parish in San Diego. And now she has launched, br briefly, she was worked for the Benedict Sixteenth Institute. And before she decided to launch her own venture, which is called Canticle. And I believe it's, you can find out more at canticle.net or is that, what's that? That's correct. That? Yep, canticle.net. Especially okay. if you're in the San Diego area and she is doing some teaching by Zoom if you've always wanted to learn uh, how to chant or some touch-ups for your voice. So. She's on the board of uh, the um, Church Music Association of America. So she's just the real deal all the way around. And uh, Marianne, wonder, I'm wondering if you, I know I was really fascinated to hear when Grace invited you or you permitted Grace. I don't know, you guys are a cabal there, clearly. You and Grace are in cahoots um, to, uh, to come and teach uh, these women Gregorian chant. How did that idea come about and what was it like? Well, like most great ideas, it wasn't mine. It was Grace. <laughs> it was Grace and uh, well, Grace uh, with a capital G and God's Grace with a lower G that uh, landed Grace in the choir. Grace Williams it was in the choir I was directing at that time and uh, the more familiar I got with her work, I was just very intrigued and she, um, after seeing me work, you know, with chant camp. So I also do youth chant camps over the summer and go to different states and places. And after ha she had some familiarity with that and the workshops, she thought, she asked me about coming to teach some of any clients who wanted to. So Grace's approach is, is amazingly beautiful in that she just provides what she thinks is helpful for her clients and then they can opt in or opt out. So for anybody who wanted, any of her clients and staff who wanted to, um, to have, uh, to learn a little bit about Gregorian chant as Grace said, and really um, profoundly moved me. She said, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for our clients to be praising God with their whole bodies and to kind of reclaim their bodies for Christ. And Grace's motto is, Grace, chime in and help me out here, but to reclaim all things in Christ or help, can you? Restore, yeah. yeah. Restore, okay. I should know my Bible better, to restore all things in Christ. So um, that launched, um, that launched, uh, our, you know, I was able to work with the clients uh, several times over the last year, two years, and uh, developed just a, a what I think, I mean, I've, what's one of those things where you volunteer or you go to work for something and you think you're doing something charitable. And of course, God graces you beyond what you're even able to give. So that's been my experience with Children of the Immaculate Heart. And I wanted to say just um, again about Grace's program and about um, what she offers her clients. Uh, she was kind of modest, but I mean, it's kind of a one stop shop. Children of the Immaculate Heart is, and basically she listens to her clients and whatever they need, um, she tries to make that happen. And in the way of Grace Williams, it's almost always does happen. So I remember one of the ladies couldn't make it all the time because she had, uh, she, didn't, she didn't know how to drive. No, she had never been able to, you know, so she, Grace is like, that's it. We're gonna teach you how to drive if you want to and we'll help you get your license and everything like that. So things that we kind of take for granted and this woman was in her thirties at the time. So things that we take for granted, um, I was just really, um, 
really impressed with Grace's program. And getting back to uh, my little tiny corner of that, because it's very small in the scope of their work, um, it was beautiful meeting inside the church in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And we had the church all to ourselves and we would, um, and we would uh, all learn chants together. And I had um, a few skeptics at first who came along beautifully and just to see them praising God and hear them praising God and hearing their voices get stronger uh, for something so beautiful um, has just been a huge blessing. Well, it really strikes a really deep chord in me, Marianne, listening to both you and Grace uh, Williams talk. Um, because, you know, the, the mission of the Benedict 16th Institute, which was the vision of Archbishop Cordelioni, um, and then he pulled me into it, but it's a magnificent vision. It's about opening the door of beauty to God. And uh, beauty has a power to touch hearts and it has, I, I think, a power to heal. It has a way of getting around all of our cognitive roadblocks we throw up uh, to God. And um, I'm, I, I, I'm wondering if you've had that experience in your life and, and maybe also if you saw some of that with Children of the Immaculate Heart when you went there. I did, I did without going into um, major details because the hour is not about me. I, I had some um, real struggles early in life and a history of sexual abuse myself. And uh, I don't t discuss that with the clients just because I'm there to serve them. Uh, however, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, but I will say that it was, and I know I shared this with you, Maggie, how healing it was for me personally to be a part of a group uh, that was getting together with a shared traumatic experience and turning their lives around and just, you know, owning their own lives, basically, where they had been denied that opportunity in a far more dramatic way than I had been. Uh, so it was very, uh, speaking of restoring all things in Christ, it was incredibly restorative for me personally. I'm going to get, I'm going to get for clumped here. I'm going to start crying. All right. Well, we don't ruin your voice right before we pray to Mary. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Grace, so, were you happy, did you happen to be there when, um, uh, Marianne yeah. Carr Wilson, uh, did these workshops? Well, I don't think I was there for all of them, but I was there for a good number. Yeah. Why did you decide to do this? What gave you this, this impulse? Well, you know, music, there's, I think there's like the nature and grace in the answer. <laughs> like on a natural level, singing is very healing for, I mean, you know, art therapy is like a very, very helpful tool in therapy. And um, it, it kind of is a way to find your voice, like not just your singing voice, but your your deep voice of being able to like express yourself and to process your emotions and everything. So, um, and, and to get outside of your, yourself. Um, so on that level, I thought it would be uh, a good opportunity for our women. And then on the level of grace, and maybe it sounds funny, but I mean, in the, in the Old Testament, right? Like when King David would sing this, his psalms, like demons would be cast out of of Saul, <laughs> like Saul would be at peace to his rage, like when David would sing his psalms, and and we know that in you know in the tradition of the church in the Gregorian chants, which many are the psalms of David, um, there's like an exorcism power in it too. Like there's a real spiritual power in the prayer of the church. It's the liturgy, um, it's Christ, like it's the church's prayer, and and and. And certain circumstances, it's Christ's own prayer to the Father. And so to be able to be like use your body for the prayer of the church is spiritually like very powerful and healing, like like what Marianne was saying. So um, you know, even just listening to it, and it has a very calming effect in and of itself. Um, so I think is kind of two twofold answer. Archbishop, it reminds me a little bit of, um, you might unmute yourself, uh, reminds me a little bit of what happened when we took our uh, Benedict XVI Scola to San Quentin prison to give them a taste of sacred music. And then, and this was your idea, uh, I, I believe. And then we 
we what happened when we asked them if they'd like to fo form a Latin mass scola? Do you remember that? Were you? Oh, I actually, I think, were you there at that moment? Yes, I think you were, yes. weren't you? Yeah. Yes, no, I remember that well. I, I knew this was going to go over well because the men there, they really worship well. You know, Jesus is alive and well behind bars. And they have a great worshiping community there. And they really love to sing. They sing with all their heart and they sing well. Uh, most at the mass, mostly they do contemporary type music. Sometimes they'll do a more traditional hymn, but it's, there are no like ideological divisions like we have in many areas of the church. Uh, they just love to worship and be together and, and give glory to God. So I, I knew this would be successful. So um, that's when uh, Rebecca was forming that, uh, Rebecca Wu forming that Scola and she went there to, uh, with the Scola to sample the different eras of chant and explain it and see who was interested. I think they had 75 of the uh, inmates show up for that. and. Uh, she recruited 30 for, for the SCOLA. And then uh, my idea was, that... was just, but it was interesting that you meant, as you said, Latin mass SCOLA. That wasn't really the intention. My intention was to incorporate Gregorian chant within the masses that they, they regularly have in addition to the other music that they're doing. Actually, they normally do this uh, Kyrie, kind of a little bit contemporary flavor, but chanted style Kyrie. Um, so it's to incorporate more of that that music, but I don't know. I I surmise it's because the the chaplain thought that if it's Gregorian chant school, it means we should have a traditional Latin mass. So they started having a traditional Latin mass there. The they have a dedicated. It's one of the few prisons that has a dedicated Catholic chapel when the whole eye altar is still up there in the altar rail. Um, so they did one or two of them. Uh, then there was some difficulty with coordinating the schedule and then COVID hit. So it's all kind of been suspended, but they had one or two traditional Latin Oh masses. no, I, I remember vividly, like we didn't know what would happen. So we gave them a taste of this music. And then, um, you know, when Rebecca said, how many of you would like to join a Scola? Like 30 hands were raised. Yeah. And afterwards, one of the prisoners came up. I'm, I'm gonna get back to our topic in hand, but one of the prisoners uh, came up and said, if I have to be here in San Quentin, I want to be here listening to music like that. And so it, it, it was just a very powerful experience. Um, I'm going to invite, pause a minute and invite you, if you have any questions for Grace, um, anything you wanna know about Children of the Immaculate Heart or any comments, the chat box is open. Uh, so start typing and, um, will uh i suppose that you might also let me let me let me say we're going to switch topics just a little bit and invite bernadette cartinson in to share with us her thoughts about the sketch of saint josephine baquita which we will auction off to raise money for children of the immaculate heart i'm hoping you would be, you, you can uh, bid via the chat box and we'll follow up with you afterwards um, so get ready for that. And I think that what I'd really like to do is, uh, oh, here's a question. How do clients find children of the Immaculate Heart, Grace? Yeah, um, thanks Barbara for that question. Um, at the Refuge, which is a teenager's home, the kids are actually um, sent to us by social workers or probation officers. So because we're a licensed facility, um, Basically, you have to be a licensed facility to take kids who are in the system. And so once you're, you're licensed, you kind of get to go and advertise your home to social workers. And then they get to know you and you just get too many referrals. Um, so those kids are, are, are sent to us because basically because they have behavior issues or mental health issues that won't allow them to be in home-based care and have it be safe for them or their or family members. So they need to be in, um, in a home where they can get intensive mental health treatment. Um, and then for the other program, it's largely word of mouth. Um, and we are listed with 2-on-1, which is like a homeless hotline. Um, so we'll get calls from that. Um, we have gotten referrals from like law enforcement or the district attorney's office, but mostly it's honestly women telling other women 
um, because they a lot of, they know each other in this life. Um, referring them to our program is how most of the ones who we actually end up taking come. That's a great, um, Barbara. Uh, oh, Amabel says I just moved to the San Diego area and would like to volunteer. How do I get information? Grace. Oh. Welcome to San Diego. Um, you can visit our website, uh, which is childrenoftheimmaculateheart.org and um, send an email like through that, uh, like a little uh, message there and let us know that you wanna volunteer and our very own Cody Thompson, who's here on this call, will get back to you. <laughs> uh, uh, Amabel, if you, with your permission, I will forward your email to Cody too, so he can follow up. Um, with you, that's a good. And then uh, Barbara, another question. Are there other chapters of Children of the Immaculate Heart? Are you just in San Diego or? Yeah, we're just in San Diego. Um, says wistfully, do you have eyes on <laughs> Sorry. expansion? <or? laughs> um, yeah, with this question about the, the kid's age, um, the youngest at that home is 12, would be 12 years old, and the oldest is 17, although we can keep them after they turn 18, um, if they turn 18 while they're with us. So, um, yeah, basically all through the teenage years, and then the other program is 18 and up. Most are in their 20s and 30s, but we've had some older as well. Are there children in the system who've been trafficked younger than 12? Is that something that... Is... Yeah, you know what, we had a referral for an 11-year-old. And anyways, we couldn't, we couldn't take her because they wanted, it's, it's hard because if you're trafficked under 12, the homes for little kids don't want you because you're the bad kid who's going to teach the other kid bad stuff, but they don't want to send you to the home for older girls because you're going to learn worse things from the older girls. So this poor 11 year old is like floating around. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's more rare, of course, like most of them are mid, mid teens. Um, but I know um, Rob Moscato, one of our board members, he's a chaplain for the diocese here in Juneau Hall, and he's seen a girl as young as nine um, in the girls part of the Juvenile Hall, like, and he visits girls who are, who've been trafficked. So, I mean, it happens. Um, but yeah, average age of entry is around 16, but there are like pretty like little like kids who get sucked into this. Val, oh, thank you. Val has a question. Do you know or work with Talithan Kum, International Organization for Those in Consecrated Life Working Against Trafficking? Today, today they sponsored an eight-hour prayer service with mu mu music, scripture, readings, prayer intentions in multiple languages on Facebook and YouTube. Are you familiar with them, Grace? I am, yeah. Talitha Kum is, um, it, it's what our Lord said, little girl arise when, when he raised the the dead girl um, to life and give her back to her parents. And they've, this group has taken this name um, for, for as its sort of spiritual understanding of what they're doing. Um, yeah, you know, I've tried to reach out to them and have never gotten a response back. It's, I mean, we're not an institute of consecrated life, so maybe we're not their, their thing. But um, yeah, it's an international group that of sisters of all different orders, um, for those who aren't familiar, so sisters of all different orders who are doing something to combat trafficking can be part of this. Um, this organization and work together um, as different congregations to fight trafficking. I don't know, it's not too prevalent in the US, but very prevalent in Europe and, and elsewhere, <laughs> Africa. Barbara Reed wants to know, Grace, how are you funded? Um, so our program, uh, the St. Paquita's program is entirely um, privately funded through our donors and supporters. Um, we do have a few um, private foundations that we get grants from as well. We apply to, to for grants each year. Um, and then the refuge um, we just purchased. So we have a capital campaign going on for the refuge right now. But um, for the actual kids care, um, foster the foster care funding because their foster youth um, does pay for us to take care of them, to pay for like the staff and their therapy um, and medical needs and stuff like that. Val mentions, I know there are Josephine Bakita houses in Seattle and Milwaukee that work to assist those moving out of trafficking. I suppose, are you like in an informal contact with the other Bakita houses or are you aware of what's happening? I am aware of a few others. Yeah, there are a couple throughout the country that have named themselves after her. Um, I'm not like intimately familiar with what they're doing, but yeah, there are um, 
there are a good number of other groups and, and a good number of religious sisters in the United States who are, you know, it's maybe not a giant thing you wouldn't know about it. Like here in San Diego, there are two sisters who run a home for international victims of mostly labor trafficking. And no one knows they do their thing in secret. So there are lots of people who are combating this. Um, yeah. That's great. All right. I am going to introduce our painter. And I think the best way to do that actually is to share two minutes of an interview that Archbishop did on Raymond Arroyo last week. So let me bear with me while I, oh, I want to click share sound. Well, maybe I'll optimize it for video clip, whatever that means, and make it big, and then play it for you. Let you go. The Benedict the Sixteenth Institute, which you founded five years ago, encourages beautiful liturgy and a Catholic culture of the arts. The institute has announced a year of the homeless with a requiem mass to be celebrated in November. You've also organized a series of fundraisers via Zoom to raise money for ministries working with the needy. The first one scheduled for February eighth. What prompted you to focus on the homeless this year? This started about two years ago when um, in the Archdiocese we decided in uh, November to have a memorial mass for people who died homeless. Uh, then we did it the following year. And then it, with our Benedict XVI Institute, we have our composer in residence, Frank LaRocca, who composed the Mass of the Americas. So I decided for the second mass to commission would be uh, a Rakua mass uh, for the homeless. And I asked him to, through sacred music, convey the sense of life on the streets of the chaos and the fear um, and the, the confusion using musical elements could use dissonance or syncopation, things like that. Um, and so in order to um, help heal and, and unite people through beauty. And so we then we came up with the idea to have a whole year of these special events that will raise funds to help uh, organizations that are assisting the homeless and using the arts. We've also uh, commissioned uh, San Francisco artist uh, Bernadette Karstensen to uh, do a painting of the patron saints of the homeless, who's on, whose feast days we'll be observing through these uh, special events throughout the year. So bringing together truth, beauty, and goodness in, in support of and addressing uh, the people who are homeless. Your Excellency, thank you. And you can find out more about the Year of the Homeless fundraisers and Mass and how you can participate at freethemass.com. Archbishop Court. All right. Now I have to press escape so I can get back to you guys and stop that sharing. There we go. Oops, admit Christian. Um, so Bernadette, can you say a few words? Uh, what? Welcome. Are you there? Hi. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Bernadette. Uh, I'm a big admirer of your work. Um, and we're so grateful that you have stepped in here to help us. The, the, the concept is we, we kind of are innovating here with developing the, what we call the patron saints of the homeless. Mm -hmm. um, whose feast days are scattered throughout the year so that we can do different events for different charities. And also, uh, and they're centered around what the, sort of the, the, the causes of homelessness. So St. Bernard, Le, uh, St. Benedict Joseph Lebray Le is the patron saint of the homeless. St. Josephine Baquita is the patroness of those who've been trafficked. Um, St. Anthony of Padua, who we give St. Anthony's bread in gratitude to the poor for everything that God has given us. St. Maximilian Kolbe, who may strike you as unusual in this regard, but he is the patron saint of drug addicts because he was uh, killed, martyred, by an injection of carbolic acid. Mother Teresa, who needs no introduction. And then, of course, the patron of our great city of San Francisco, St. Francis of Assisi. And uh, the, the idea is that when we do this big requiem mass, um, we'll be able to, to put the painting up as a shrine so people can uh, pray to the patron saints of the homeless. And so Bernadette, tell me about uh, your thinking about this commission, in particular, mm -hmm. you're thinking about 
uh, St. Josephine by Kita, whose sketch we're going to show you in a minute. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm so honored that you asked me to do this project. And I loved learning about St. Paquita. And I watched that movie that Grace mentioned. And I just like loved her so much, <laughs> even though the story is not accurate completely to, to her biography, but just like what she said, they captured her spirit and was, it just made me like really want to draw her. <laughs> and so, um, but I, I started out with just a little composition just to like give you an idea of how she'll be fitting in with the composition. She'll be right there. And then I have um, our mother of sorrows and she's holding her sorrowful heart and there's St. Francis kneeling down. Um, but she's also holding the Christ child um, so that it's not, it doesn't look like a totally mournful image. There's also a tenderness there to show the mother and child. Um, and so luckily St. Paquita has some portraits, photographic portraits online. So I can get her face. And this is the size of the sketch here on Bristol. That, you and know, that's, that, that's interesting, Bernadette, because of course a lot of saints in, shrouded in the, in mis, you know, ancient history, we don't know what they looked at, but we, we have photographs of yeah. Josephine Paquita. Yeah, I love it when you can see what their face really looked like. So there's a couple good pictures of her and then I, I picked the three quarters view and then I just take a picture of somebody posed with um, like a costume that sort of looks like her habit. And that's how I work the sketch. And then, um, so I'll do that for every figure and then compile them all and the, the final painting should be about a 16 by 20. Now, I know you're a mother, a very busy mother, and uh, as well as a really fine artist. How do you, how do you, so I admire you, that's, that's the short way of saying <laughs> I really admire you. How do you think about your calling as an artist? What are you trying to do as a painter for Christ? Well, I just, I guess, I just want to make beautiful artwork because just the church needs that. <laughs> you know, and I just want to use my skills for that purpose. Um, I don't really see any, any better way to use them. And, uh, you know, I consider my vocation um, as being a mother and then being an artist comes second, but I just, I just have to do it. I could never not do it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a real artist. So I'm going to, oh, um, first I'm going to let Jeanette in and uh, I think it would, I'm going to try sharing the um, uh, sketch. I was incredibly wowed, by the way, when I went to look at the Eventbrite and we have, uh, uh, well, there's 2,900, I think in 83 net net uh, in donations. So I'm hoping that we've never tried this. So I'm hoping that there's someone who'd like to uh, receive this beautiful sketch of what will become, I think, a significant uh, painting. And 100%, uh, Bernadette, thank you. She is donating this sketch and in order to help these women. And so I'm going to put it up and I'm not going to spend much time because I do not want to take away from the opportunity to talk some more and to also pray some more. So let me see where I think I have it. Where do I have it? No, that's the litany. Okay, I can't find it. So I'm going to switch to, can you hold it up for us, Bernadette? And sure. show it very close to the camera so people can see and say a few words so it gets big. If you're okay. saying, yeah, go ahead, just... And I'll hold it still there. So that that's what her face really looked like. Um, and it's, you can see the size of it here. All right. Um, my, my husband always says he likes my, my drawings better than the painting. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> is there anyone who'd like to make a donation of $100 for this beautiful sketch of the artist? I'm not going to go on with a real art. I'm not an auctioneer, so mm -hmm. this, this may not be the, the best way of doing it. But you can either put it in the chat box or you can email me afterwards. Um, and uh, we'd love to send this to you. Um, and uh, I, I would actually like that myself. So who knows? If you don't, I'm probably going to be I'm probably going to be putting that up in my wall. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Do you, oh, we got two bids for 100. Anyone want to go to 150? I'll let you, you let you, I'll periodically, oh, oh, Mora, thank you. 150 from Mora. Anyone want to go to 200? It's a beautiful sketch of an important painting. 200 from Barbara. Oh my gosh. 200 from Amabel, but you were second, Amabel. 250, can we go to 250 for a beautiful painting that you can pray to? And uh, it sounds like, Oh, Mark Villamore stepped in for 250. Thank you, Mark. Three, three, let's go to 500. Anyone wanna go to 500? You know it's to help these women, so why not? Is that too much? How about 300? Anyone wanna go to 300? Oh, we've got 500. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Grace. This is a tribute to everything that you've done. $500. Anyone want to go higher? I'm going to go once, going twice, going two and a half times, sold for 500. Thank you. That is really, really amazing. Thanks to all of you who bid on the painting and everyone who showed up. And I, as I said, we had, I think, 50 donations. Praise the Lord, the winning buyer says. So the winning donor says, the giver. So thank you very much. That was kind of fun, an experiment. And we really, and Grace says, thank you very much. Um, okay, so the, that was just so exciting to me. I'm sorry, I have to wait. Archbishop, do you, uh, let, let's switch just for a moment. Uh, first of all, do you have any reaction to uh, what Grace was saying, particularly about suffering that you can't help those who suffer until you've taken up your own offered up your own suffering well that's all the the, the virtue of solidarity i think and uh i think it's very um uh, indicative of the kind of the the way the christian sees and acts in the world of grace you know you really entered into their world and it's not just a matter of giving something I have and they need so you can help them. Uh, Pope Benedict has this beautiful line in his um, encyclical on Catholic social teaching, God is love, where he says that um, my gift to another won't mean anything if I'm just giving some something to them. And in fact, that can even be condescending. It, it doesn't really make a difference unless I invest myself personally in my gift. Then, then it becomes an exchange, right? Both give and both receive. And that, that's, that's the fruit of this virtue we speak so often of nowadays of, of solidarity. It's, it's really another way of saying communion. Communion is sharing, sharing of spiritual and material goods. That, that's how Christian uh, sees our, the way we live life in this world. And I think, uh, Grace, you, that's what you've done with uh, the Children of the Immaculate Heart. And, um, and I know with those, those assisting you, um, Marianne, with, with the choir and teaching them to sing chant as a way of healing, I think of Frank LaRocca and uh, sharing a little bit of what he did to compose that uh, Requiem Mass for the homeless, where he, he studied, he, not only did he study homelessness, he got to know people who were homeless. He entered into that world in order to bring not just creative energy, but real holiness, uh, investing himself and his heart into the music. So uh, I think this is, how, this is how Christians transform the world and make, it a, make this world a place that is more similar to the kingdom of God that we're on pilgrimage toward. Grace also spoke 
Uh, I don't know, Grace, do you want to chime in and say something to the Archbishop? I shouldn't step on that moment there. <laughs> no, you're good. Only that that's the most rewarding part about this work. I mean, I can say, you know, the refuge is 24-7 awake staff, so there's people there right now in any moment of the day who are a part of it, and I, that's what we really love, is just being able to be a part of their lives. It's, it's a complete privilege, and especially as people who don't trust people easily, and when you get to be in that space, it's just I just have a hard time imagining my life without it at this point, so. That's beautiful, Grace. I, I, I also wanted to um, uh, so pick up on what Grace said as a convert, that it's the, the vision of the church. In particular, she spoke about the equal dignity of every human soul. And I, I thought about that because it, it, it really seemed to me to be part of your vision that you've spoken about for this Requiem Mass, that the Mass, yes, we want to have compassion, but in the root sense of suffering with, that, that fundamentally what we would like with our um, Requiem Mass to convey is the equal dignity of every soul before God regardless of whether, and, and of course, Pope Francis happened in late January to come out and ask all of us to pray for Edwin, a Nigerian immigrant who died, he, the Pope says, died on the streets in Rome, just a few blocks from St. Peter's Square. The Pope said, abandoned even by us, but not abandoned by God. Just ask you, Archbishop, maybe that, is that what, you know? Oh, the, the yes, equal well, that was, yes. Great, that was a real great confirmation for our, our, our exactly our vision for this year for the homeless. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was very, very providential and very timely that the Pope is urging us to offer up our, up our prayers for, for the homeless and those, those who have died on the street. So we're implementing that immediately. Yeah. Um, I have a, a comment from Julie Latham. Just heard of this. This is a very necessary ministry. I'm in South Carolina. I am the person in charge of our parish respect life ministry. Our focus is abortion, no, but uh, we can and will be addressing all life. So I will get more info. I'm in the Charleston uh, diocese and um, Maybe I would say, Julie, if you email me, you all have my email because if you hit reply to, to uh, the registration, uh, to the email that sent you to the registration, or, or I can just tell you now, it's maggie1960gallagher at gmail.com. And I'll put you in, in touch with someone from Children of the Immaculate Heart who maybe can give you more resources. Um, um, another in a private message to me says, uh, the question of abandonment, she's really responding to that idea that, uh, that we're abandoning people. Uh, she saw so much of that in the LA mission on Skid Row. And you know, there's so much suffering that it's easy to avert your eyes because how can one person take it all in? Um, so Grace, I guess we just admire you so much for being one of those people who decided to do something about it like mother Teresa like I just it's it, it's just a wonderful story about what you've done and what you are doing um, I think I think mother Teresa had it right when she said it's just just the one person in front of her <laughs> you know we don't have to fix the whole problem but the one be the one for that one person you know well, if we all did that, the world would be a different place. So um, I, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to do more, that's all. Um, we're going to move towards a close. Like I said, I stay for a half an hour social hour. If anyone wants to chat and get to know each other. Uh, I like to do that with the video on so that we can actually meet you. But if you really insist, you can keep your videos off. And we will have a much more extended prayer uh, in the end because we have Marianne with us who will give us an example of some beautiful chant with her wonderful uh, young people. Uh, and
And I want to remind you that with Marianne, that if you want, especially if you're in, if you want to hold a summer chant camp anywhere in the country, or if you uh, want the services of the choir or her services uh, for something, that canticle.net is the way to reach all things Marianne Carr Wilson. She also, uh, uh, it's a nonprofit, so she also is looking for support to further her mission and uh, her work with all these wonderful kids. Um, there's a question about whether our Requiem Mass is going to be on Zoom or YouTube. It is going to be celebrated for the very first time in November as is proper for a Requiem Mass, uh, November 6th at the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption. So if you can be in San Francisco and assuming we're done with COVID, uh, mark your calendars. Uh, the last time we did this, EWTN uh, broadcast it. Uh, so I expect we will certainly record it. So there'll be some way for you to see it, even if you're not going to be flying into San Francisco or driving down. Yes, Ar Archbishop? Yes, we, we started some time ago, uh, even before COVID, uh, live streaming masses from the cathedral. So it will at least be live streamed, if not broadcast by EWTN or someone. Yeah, I know Archbishop, but uh, a music with uh, a mass with instrumentation and choir is not going to be heard very well unless we arrange to do it specially. So that's why I didn't, I don't know if we're gonna be able to- I'm saying if people wanted to follow it in real time, and don't have well, the you might not be able to hear the music very well is all I'm saying. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that and see if we can fix that problem. Um, sorry, I'm arguing with an archbishop. Not, not a good look for me. Uh, yeah, um, it was, it's, it's better than no alternative is the point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there'll be a way for you to, to, to see it or experience it, even if you're not in San Francisco. And we're hoping to release the CD of the Mass of the Americas professionally done and released uh, in the extraordinary form around that time. So I'll, I might as well mention that if you want to see, experience the Mass of the America in the extraordinary form, the next celebration we know of will be in Old St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, January 15th at 11 a.m. So another thing you can mark your calendars for. Um, the, <laughs> all right, so Mary Ann, do you want to, uh, lead us in prayers or, or motet? Here we go. Sure thing. Okay, so we have the Litany of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and, uh, this is one of the lesser known Mary and Lisa. I found it, um, just by searching, uh, and I was really excited to show Grace and show you, Maggie, and the Archbishop, because um, it's specific to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and it was composed by Cardinal Newman um, as a thanksgiving to Our Lady after he was received into the Catholic Church. So that's another cool tie-in for all you converts out there. Um, got a wonderful saint. Uh, I also want to just mention what I what I, I think I alluded to the Archbishop and Maggie and the Benedict 16 being a benefactor for our choir. We want to thank them. This choir would not be in existence if it weren't for um, the encouragement of Archbishop Corleone, who had asked us in 2018 to have a group. So the Archbishop is from San Diego and we miss him dearly. I never miss an opportunity to say that. And uh, so he asked that, uh, that I be able to form a small group of, of um, young people that could be a choir for when he comes down and has um, events in the area. And we've grown from 25 singers at first to 60 by this year. So uh, again, this is a small group of our older cantors behind me. Without further ado, we're gonna start this litany. How this is gonna work is we'll have Ariana, Paige, and myself singing everything on the left side here. And then we have everybody behind us singing. Um, we have everyone behind us singing the responses along with people at home. Of course, you can do whatever you want at home because we're not going to hear you, but uh, that's how we're designing it. Then also we have, uh, at, after the final prayer here, the it's not a very long litany, so please don't be afraid. <laughs> at the end, the Archbishop will lead us in this uh, prayer. He's going to... Uh, He's going to lead us in that section, and then we'll all come in at the O Most Merciful God. After that, we have a two and a half minute um, song for Our Lady 
to offer to everyone. It's called Dixit Maria, and it's uh, by Hans Leo Hosler. Uh, the words are taken straight from scripture. Uh, the angel of the Lord said unto Mary, and she said yes. Okay. She said, be it done unto me according to thy word. There's a little more specificity for you. All right. So without further ado, Paige, what note should we start on? Okay. So here we go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. Amen. Hey. 
Let us pray. O most merciful God, everyone, who for the salvation of sinners and the refuge of the miserable was pleased that the most pure heart of Mary should be most like in charity and pity to the divine heart of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we be with this sweet and loving heart, may by the merits of the intercession of the same Blessed Virgin, Merit to be found according to the heart of Jesus, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, Archbishop, Your Excellency, would you like to give us your blessing now, or should we um, should we wait until after the motet? Let's go to the motet. <laughs> okay. Well, here we go. Archbishop is going to want, want to thank your uh, choir and also give end us by giving us all a blessing. But I wondered if you would like to pick out uh, one or two of your choir members to tell us a little bit about what their experience um, in being part of your choir is and learning Gregorian chant. You know, I would love to do that. Uh, a lot. Of, each one of them has a story to tell. I think I would like to welcome Will Sawaya first. Actually, Will, why don't you think about it? Because Ben is closer. Ben, what did you want to yeah, share? We have him step forward so we can see him. Yeah. So. Oh no. Sure. Uh, it's spectacular to put it simply to be part of this choir. 
making beautiful, making my voice, which I don't consider to be spectacular, beautiful in harmony with all these other beautiful and, I don't know, spectacular young men and women around me, making friends and working together just simply to praise God in the most wonderful way that he has given us to do so. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Would you like to come forward? Yes. Honestly, I believe- um, this wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we do this, I'm still sharing the litany screen and somebody- oh, My bad, I can yeah. stop. Okay, thanks. Good. Good call. Honestly, I believe this choir was very <laughs> beneficial to me. At first, when Mrs. Wilson asked me to sing, I did not sing at all, and I was completely horrified at the thought of singing. <laughs> but then she brought me in. We, we came and sang into the choir, and she showed us all the motets and different types of music we would be singing and praising God with, and I just fell in love with it. It's absolutely amazing, and she's done a great job with this choir. I absolutely love this choir. Will is also an assistant teacher. He turned 18 and kind of, he's toward graduating from the program. So he's been helping assistant teach. So that's fantastic. And then Sophia, did you want to give a representation also? And maybe how, how things have, how this music brings you closer to God? Because we're talking the connection between what we do here and then what we're giving, what, for example, to the children of the Immaculate Heart. Just what that means to you personally in your prayer life. Sure. I personally, Gregorian chant has transformed my life and definitely the life of my family. I know our goal is to help others pray and glorify God more. And there's nothing, I can't think of anything better than to sing, to do, to attain that goal. So I know that for my colleagues and I, that Gregorian <laughs> chant has definitely lifted our souls to God, extremely enhanced my prayer life. And I couldn't imagine anything that would help others who are in need than Gregorian chant. You know, you laugh because you call each other colleagues because that sounds like a grown-up word. But yeah. you know, in yeah, contrast, these are some of the these are some of the senior members. I should say that they all came rather last minute, and our and we we do have we have officers now that the choir is so big. So our vice president is here, and she wanted to just uh, respond to your question as well, Aubrey. So for this choir, I think we have two main purposes. First, to give honor and glory to God. That's our main purpose. And second, we want to edify the minds and hearts of the faithful. We want to bring them up to God. And like Sophia said, I can't think of any better way to do that than singing Gregorian chant and these motets. And Mrs. Wilson, she's just an amazing teacher. And I feel like this is one of the best ways that we can give glory to God is through music, because somehow that just, I don't know, we're made in a way that this music really helps us to bring our minds and hearts to God. So I'm so grateful for this experience. That is so wonderful. By the way, the chat box is filling full of comments, thanking you and telling how impressed they are with all of you. Uh, also some praise for Bernadette and thanks for her uh, sketches. So before you leave, Marianne, be sure and copy that uh, chat box so you can share it with all, all your students. Uh, Archbishop, did you wanna say a few words and offer your blessing? I could say more than a few, but I won't. <laughs> Just uh, uh, thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you, all of the beautiful voices there with you. Uh, you know, I, if I may sound a bit self-serving, I kind of feel vindicated. But with what we just, the testimony we just saw, because I have been saying for years, and Marianne, you know this, because you're one of the few who's implementing it, and the testimony has just proven it. I've been saying for years that we, and this is kind of frustrating as a bishop, we bishops are always wringing our hands about losing the youth, right? And uh, I've been saying, if we, want, if we want to form them with a Catholic soul, to be Catholic the rest of their lives, they need to know the beauty of our tradition. The best thing we can do is to te teach them. <laughs> <the liphony. laughs> And all of you beautiful young people said exactly that. <laughs> uh, Sophia, you had that line that has ch changed you indefinitely. That's exactly what I've been saying. <laughs> you, uh, you, you are thoroughly grounded in the faith. And Marianne, you have this phenomenal way of not just teaching an art form, but catechizing and forming your students in the faith through art. Uh, because as Catholics, you know, art, as beautiful as it is, and as worthy as it is an endeavor in itself, when it's sacred art, music, it's a means to an end, to give glory to God. And that's what your students are doing. So uh, thank you. This is a real treat.
Could we go with you? Could we have your blessing, okay. Archbishop? Yes, so we conclude with our blessing, the blessing now. So the Lord be with you. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you kindly and grant you his peace. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.